Well, it says we're broadcasting. Do we think we're broadcasting, guys? Yes. I think we are. Uh, well, hi, everybody. We're going to give a few seconds here. Uh, this is the first time we've ever done this, so uh, we sure hope that this is coming across uh, great on your end. Uh, Dave Fleming, Larry Bear, Farhan Zaidi, Gabe Kapler, we're all here with you for the next hour plus, however long we need uh, to chat, talk some baseball, answer some questions, uh, do a lot of things, hopefully. Um, it has been a long few weeks for all of us, and I'm sure it has been for you all as well. And we are really actually just excited to talk some Giants baseball with you tonight. So we really, really appreciate you being here with us. Um, again, this is our first time doing this. So our general format is many of you all have submitted questions ahead of time. Uh, I'm going to give Larry Farhan, Gabe, a chance just to say hi and say a few words as we get started. Uh, you know, kind of a few opening thoughts. We'll use some of your questions. Maybe I have questions. We'll have a conversation about the Giants, about everything that's going on in MLB, hopefully answer a bunch of the sort of the, the pressing questions that I'm sure all of you have. Uh, the one thing I think all of us will say here at the outset is how much we appreciate you all and how much we miss you. I mean, it's just uh, it's just been so unusual for all of us, as I'm sure it has been for you, not to be at the ballpark this time of year. And uh, you know, Larry and people in MLB are working really, really hard to just try to figure out a lot of it's not up to us, but just try to figure out when we can get things going again. We're all itching to do that. Um, and so Larry's going to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on behind the scenes as well. Hopefully answer some of those questions uh, for you as we go on tonight. But again, it's just nice to have you all with us. Uh, hopefully our connections are all great and you can hear us clearly. You can send little, uh, you know, in lieu of questions. I'm sure, I think there's a link or a, a window for you to ask questions. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. My, I would encourage you to give it a few minutes because I have a feeling a lot of the sort of big obvious ones are going to be answered early and just kind of see how the conversation gets started. Um, and then maybe chime in with more specific follow-up questions, whatever you're interested in. Um, and if there's something that's not working right for you, maybe you can get some help uh, on there as well. Larry, before I introduce you, I want to just say one quick thing as we get started, because it is April 15th. And if you've been on any of the baseball websites, MLB website, it's Jackie Robinson Day. Today would be the day that all of our players would be wearing number 42. It's obviously one of the most important days in the history of baseball, really one of the most important anniversaries in the history of this country. Jackie Robinson's debut for the Dodgers in 1947 was monumental. And I'm not diminishing that, but it's also the anniversary of the first San Francisco Giants game ever. April 15th, 1958. At Seal Stadium, just a few miles from where I'm sitting right now, the Giants and the Dodgers played the first West Coast game in the history of Major League Baseball. And the Giants franchise was never the same. The Dodgers franchise was never the same. Professional sports were never the same. And, uh, and it's a particularly good anniversary because the Giants won 8 nothing. And Orlando Cepeda, a future Hall of Famer, made his Major League debut in that game. Uh, Ruben Gomez pitched a complete game and uh, shut out Don Drysdale and the Dodgers on this date in 1958. So it feels sort of fitting that we're all, even though we're not at a ballpark right now where we should be, we're all talking Giants baseball uh, on the anniversary of the first San Francisco Giants day back in 1958. So uh, Larry, I'm going to turn it over for you for a few opening comments. You all know uh, Larry Bear, our president and CEO. Um, and Larry's got some, some first things to say before we kind of get the, the flow of the Q&A going. Larry? I do, uh, Dave, and uh, it's great hearing your voice, and it's great seeing uh, all the Giants fans. So, hi, Giants fans, and um, just hearing Dave talk a little bit about baseball uh, makes me really sort of uh, very much uh, pine for, uh, for getting back into what is normally um, – in April that is full of baseball. Unfortunately, it's, it's not. Um, I wanted to actually just pick up a little bit on what Dave said about uh, Jackie Robinson Day. Uh, it's a huge day around our sport, as you know, um, and nobody will ever wear number 42 again in a major league uniform. 
I just uh, noted, and it's probably appropriate to the, these times, about an hour ago, uh, our friend Hunter Pence sent the following tweet, which was a quote from Jackie Robinson. And it's, um, and I'm sure many of you have heard it before, it's uh, something Jackie said, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. And I think we feel that sentiment very much today in our world. Um, I want to first express uh, wishes from our organization um, to all of our fans that you are healthy and safe. Um, and we join you in all of our gratitude for what's happening uh, with the people that are putting their, their, their lives on at risk to help um, those in our communities. The, of course, the medical workers, the frontline medical workers, the grocery clerks, the uh, police and fire, and so many people in our world that are helping us at this time. Um, I wanted to talk about, uh, before we get to uh, Farhan and Gabe and the main attraction, uh, and uh, talking some baseball, I do want to just uh, answer a few questions that you may have and just kind of give you the, uh, some updates. Uh, and I also want to say in our community, not all of you are in San Francisco, not all of you are in the Bay Area, but we are really um, grateful that we have some cautious optimism about um, some, of the, some of the direction we're going, some of the trajectory we're going. Uh, we need absolute continued vigilance and continued shelter in place uh, for all of us. But um, we have some cautious optimism that, that uh, in our community, um, you know, things may be going in the right direction. The, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Major League Baseball updates. Uh, we're on various committees. Uh, Farhan is, I am, uh, and we're hearing a lot of, uh, of updates. And the, the real thing, which you probably have read, but the real bottom line, you know, uh, truth of the matter is that considerations number one, two, and three are um, the health of our, in our community and the direction we're going to get from the health officials. And we all want to return to baseball, but we all want to do it in the most safe way possible for everyone. Um, of course, the fans, but also the players and the workers and everybody at the ballparks. The goal that uh, the commissioner and all baseball officials talk about is to play as many games as possible this year. And that may lead to some unconventional timing in terms of playing uh, beyond October. So we are, uh, we know we're gonna get a lot of questions about tickets and per uh, tickets purchased. And um, we're waiting for direction uh, from Major League Baseball in terms of, uh, of policies, but we do have a policy that we're preparing that we look forward to offering to our fans and to all of you uh, that will be, you know, sort of what I think the Giants are, are known for, which is maximum flexibility. Uh, we're going to offer multiple options and we're going to be there for you uh, to, to um, understand what, what possibilities exist for tickets that you uh, perhaps have all already purchased that you might want to um, exchange, et cetera, for other games. Uh, we urge you to reach out to your customer relations associate uh, who is, is available now or um, in the coming days, uh, but you can reach out to them right now. They're available standing by and they'll be able to help you uh, answer any further questions. Um, we will be returning to baseball at Oracle Park. We just don't know when. And um, when we do so, we're also worked on working on some of the really some state of the art techniques to uh, make sure that it's as healthy as possible and as safe as possible. But as I said earlier, we're going to take our cues from the health officials and, uh, and we have to uh, be patient and we really appreciate your patience and we really appreciate your continued support. Uh, from the bottom of our hearts. So that's the opening message, Dave, and uh, and uh, happy to answer any further questions down the line. Okay, and I've, I'm already seeing a few questions trickle in on my little, I'm, I'm learning all this stuff on my little Q&A uh, uh, 
tab. So we'll we'll get to those. I I figured I'd let Farhan and Gabe say something uh, just sure. to start. Uh, so thanks, Larry Farhan. Uh, it's great to see your face, hear your voice, have a chance to talk to you. Uh, I mean, this must be so unusual for you. How's how's uh, shelter in place going for the the uh, president of baseball ops of the Giants? Well, um, a, as you know, we do have a, a nine month old at, at home, and uh, I'm surprised he hasn't shrieked and disrupted this whole call yet. I found a quiet corner of the house, so hopefully we can keep that going. And um, you know, baseball has decidedly not been the priority over the last month. I think for all of us. Uh, we've been concerned about, you know, the health and safety and well-being of our employees, people in the Giants organization, our families, our fans, people in the community. Um, but, you know, I have to say kind of hearing your voice gets me back in that baseball mode. I mean, you know, I love listening to you over the course of last year. I sent you many texts about stuff that you said on the air that I really enjoyed. So I think for, for me, for a lot of people in the organization, a lot of our fans, uh, hearing your voice and our other great broadcasters' voice is so synonymous with Giants baseball. So it's great to hear you and uh, really excited to be on with our fans. And, you know, I just say uh, to our fans, thank you for making the time to join with us here. Uh, really appreciate your support. Um, I've come to learn in my year and a half in the organization that we have the best fans in the game. And I also want to extend a thank you to the fans that came out this spring. Um, came out to Arizona, um, and I think, you know, we're going to get into it more, but it was a really fun spring for us uh, that came to an unfortunate end, but we had great energy. Our fans were really supportive. I ran into people at the stadium all the time talking about how excited they were about this next chapter of Giants baseball, and, you know, just by the turnout we're getting on this call, you can tell that people are excited about it. So, again, understanding the proper perspective we need to have, uh, you know, with the state of the world right now, it's still fun to get this little window and little escape to get to talk about baseball. Yeah, well said. Um, and Gabe, maybe that's a good transition to you because unlike Farhan, who had last year to get to know a lot of Giants fans, get to know the organization, this was your first spring. It was your first few weeks there. I echo what Farhan said. I mean, it just seemed like camp was going, it, maybe it's easy and cheap to say, hey, we're having a great camp, but it just seemed like there was so much positivity down there. Uh, maybe that's a good segue for you to start how your first few weeks and months uh, on the job have been. Yeah, no, I'm, it, it was great. There was incredible energy at the ballpark, uh, like Farhan said. And I think first, I want to echo what Dave, Farhan, and, and Larry have, have already said. Um, I'm excited about hearing your voice, Dave. It's, it's really nice. It, it gets me excited about uh, how quickly we can get back to the ballpark safely, of course. Uh, but it, it makes me start thinking about baseball and echo what Larry said and, and what you said about Jackie Robinson Day. Uh, I can tell you that as a player first, one of the most exciting days was coming to the ballpark and seeing that number 42 jersey, no matter who you played for, hanging in your locker. Um, sometimes we got to pull up socks that had references to Jackie Robinson, our socks. I always wore my socks up on that day. And I can share some some sadness right now that – uh, we're not wearing a Giants jersey with a number 42 on our backs right now. And um, we've seen a lot of posts on social media, both from the Giants and, and some of our players referencing those jerseys. Um, it's, it's a big deal. I, I would have felt extraordinarily grateful to be wearing that jersey. And speaking of gratitude, I, I see that there's well over 700 participants on this call. Um, among those 700 plus participants, I imagine there's some first responders, perhaps some healthcare workers, maybe some people that work at supermarkets. And I can tell you, every time I go into a supermarket, whether it be once a week or twice a week, I'm always grateful that there's somebody there to, to bag groceries, say hello, just to have quick interaction. I always say, thanks, thanks for being here. So to the people on this call who may fall into that category and everybody, thank you for uh, allowing us to have this experience with you. Um, I'm grateful that we get to utilize technology there, you know, rewind 15 years or so, and we might not be able to, to be face to face uh, with, with all of you. And I can tell you what I miss the most about being away from baseball is being in a dugout and hearing fans, just the cheers and the support and the encouragement. It goes an, an incredible distance for all of us. So 
uh, before we get into any of the baseball stuff that was going on in spring training, I think it's, it's for me, I just want to express some gratitude and say thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. I mean, it is really cool that we could do something like this. And I'm sure we're going to try as long as we have to, to, to keep doing things like this. But, um, you know, the questions are pouring in many about the topics that you all would guess. And a lot of people asking just sort of broad uh, questions about how spring training was going. Uh, you know, maybe Gabe and Farhan, that'd be a good chance for you guys to, I don't know, just start us off a little baseball chat, to, to, talking about from your perspective, were you getting some of the things done? I mean, those, those, that groundwork still is going to pay off at some point here, whether it's in a few weeks or a few months, we don't know that. But at some point, all that work you all were doing is going to pay off. What, what were your first impressions of, because we were, we were playing games. I mean, it wasn't, you know, the first few days of camp. We were into exhibition games. Uh, you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think from my standpoint, it was a really fun spring watching Gabe and his staff work. Um, you know, we had a mix of uh, veteran players that have uh, been in the organization for a long time, um, a lot of new people coming on board from different organizations, a lot of prospects coming up through the system, and the way Gabe and his staff brought the group together um, you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, I think a lot of the players were pretty outspoken about what an enjoyable and energetic camp it was. Um, and seeing, you know, guys like, you know, Hunter Pence and Pablo, guys who've been here for a long time, and, and the example that they were setting. Um, we had guys, you know, like a Darren Ruff who signed on a minor league deal coming back from Asia. And, you know, I know for a lot of our fans, a lot of our games boiled down to when's Darren Ruff coming back up again. So, um, <laughs> You know, I, I mean, really, from an offensive standpoint, you know, uh, Darren's a good place to start, but uh, it was really exciting seeing the different sources of right-handed power that we had coming on over the course of the spring. Um, not just Darren Ruff, but Zach Green was having a terrific camp. Um, Gabe, who's that um, uh, catching prospect we have? Uh, <laughs> everybody keeps talking about. Yeah, it's been too long. I forgot his name. <laughs> um, but obviously, Joey Bart, uh, and you just kind of go down the line. I mean, I have our spring training stats pulled up here, which uh, ironically enough, I don't really look at during spring training, but now <laughs> happy to go back and think about who is playing well. It's kind of fun to look at some of the impressive numbers that our guys put up, and I think that's a testament to the coaching staff and the work that Gabe and his hitting group did uh, on the offensive side of the ball. And then pitching-wise, uh, you know, it was fun to see Johnny Cueto back in action, and uh, I know that he was feeling really healthy, and that was what we were most concerned about. You know, Jeff Samarjo was rounding into shape and, and pitching really well, and his stuff was getting better every outing. And then the two free agents that we'd signed to come in and be part of the rotation to stabilize the rotation, Kevin Gosman and Drew Smiley, you know, I thought that our pitching coaches, Brian Bannister and um, Andrew Bailey, were doing great work with them, and I know they were really excited about the progress that they made. And, you know, we had a bunch of guys competing for the fifth starting spot. So, you know, it was a fun mix of guys coming along, learning new things, some, you know, interesting competitions that uh, were taking place. And, and you want a little bit of that. You don't want that roster totally set uh, going into spring training where guys don't feel like they had anything to play for. And I think that was some of the energy that we saw was that there were some positions and some roles that were up for grabs and guys were really stepping up and, and uh, making plays for those jobs. Gabe, what do you think? You, you uh, agree with what Farhan said? Uh, absolutely. And, and I've heard Farhan use the word energy several times, and I'll just I'll keep it rolling. Um, and he mentioned uh, Kevin Gosman. I, I take everyone back to the last spring training game. Uh, we were in Texas, and we had some rain, but we had Gosman on the mound. And it was really interesting. Like, he had built up to where he was very close to, to having enough volume under his belt, enough workload to be ready to start the season. Uh, his split looked good. He had a fastball that was carrying through the zone. He had a ton of confidence. He was working on a new breaking ball. Farhan referenced the work that some of our pitching coaches had, had done with our, our pitchers, and they did a, a tremendous job, and Gosman was really standing out. And after that game, I, I spoke to some of our, our beat writers and was excited to name uh, Johnny Cueto, our opening day starter, on behalf of all of our coaches and our front office and uh, that, that brought a lot of pride as well. Uh, Farhan mentioned some of the offensive performances. 
Uh, Dickerson was really starting to swing the bat well in that game in particular. Uh, Dubon uh, really had an interesting camp and was driving the baseball. And I think everybody just kind of fell in love with Dubon more and more. I think we're going to get uh, have some opportunity to talk about him. And I'm excited to share a conversation I had with him uh, earlier, earlier today. Uh, I think across the board, our coaches did a, a really tremendous job. I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity to put those coaches in place. Um, it was a long uh, interview process, but Kai Correa really stood out as, as an excellent and energetic and very well prepared bench coach. Um, everybody knows that Alyssa Nacken has, has done a great job of, of bringing people together, uh, but really becoming a well-rounded coach. But it's really a, across the board. Ron Wotus has brought such leadership uh, and brought such leadership to our camp as um, a voice of experience, but also ingenuity. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of our coaches together brought a ton of energy, but our players, to Farhan's point earlier, had really bought into to the new style. Um, they really bought into the competition and they really bought into the challenges. And they bought in not just internally with the coaches and with each other, but they did so publicly. And the reason that was important is because it gave us the platform to continue to raise the bar. They said, we want to get better. We want to get, we want to be challenged. And we know there's more in the tank. And that just inspired us to work as a team to give them more of those challenges. Those were my main takeaways from camp. Yeah, good. Uh, go ahead, Farhan. I was just going to say one, one reflection, I think, of, of how positively we felt camp was going is I think back to when we made the difficult but I think right decision to shut down our camp, uh, which we made a little bit ahead of the industry. Um, and Gabe, myself, and our GM, Scott Harris, split up uh, you know, our, uh, the list of our players and called each player individually, let them know what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, and you know, so many of those calls had a similar theme, which is I know this is going to come as a disappointed appointment for you because you were so excited to play baseball this year. You know, you're coming back from an injury or you had a great camp or um, you know, you're back in the organization you know, where you'd seen uh, uh, you know, so many of your career highlights. There were so many positive stories um, that you know, unfortunately came to a halt when spring training ended. And again, I think you know, in, in a sense that that's a reflection of how well things were going and how excited people were. Just one note of uh, procedure. I'm seeing all these questions from everybody. So uh, if you missed our first statement, if, you're, if you joined even just a couple minutes late, we're trying to get to as many questions as we can. If I don't name you by name, uh, sorry, I'm not real good at the multitasking. I'm having to hit my screen and go back and forth. So I'm trying to figure this out, but I apologize for that. I'm seeing your question. One common one, Gabe, I think sort of references something you just said, and that is, okay, Cueto was healthy. He felt ready to go, ready for his opening day start. Uh, a, a natural follow-up to that is, what are those players doing now to try to stay ready? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's kind of a, a – we don't get to see them in the way that we would ordinarily during camp, during his spring training. They're all doing what we're doing. So uh, what is everybody doing to, to try to stay ready? Yeah, so I'm laughing because I did have an opportunity to talk to Johnny specifically about what he's doing. But before we get there, um, <laughs> just, to, just to set the stage, Larry, myself, Farhan, Dave, and others, we talked about what might come up on this call. So we knew that there would be some players that, that might be of, of special interest. So I wanted to be prepared for that and had a couple of conversations. So with Cueto, I think some people who have followed Johnny on Instagram know that he likes to ride horses. So um, I, I asked him what he's been doing and he, he shared with me how he's been trying to stay in shape. I said, Johnny, uh, I notice you've been riding, you know, your horse quite a bit. Is that, is that to work on your core, right? Because you're going to, you're really going to stabilize when you, when you use your knees to stay on, stay on the horse. And he actually, he actually acknowledged that. And uh, he mentioned that um, the, the first couple of times he gets back on the horse, he, he gets a little bit of a sore back and his shoulders really feel it. But in, in all seriousness, he talked about how important it is for him to be staying in shape. He's in the Dominican Republic. He's doing very well. Uh, as far as Dubon, I think it's interesting to bring up. He's built himself a little cage, and that cage has like a wiffle ball shooter. It shoots these really small balls. So he sent me some video, and he's just swinging like a wiffle ball bat inside and outside of his house with with some netting up, and 
He's just driving baseballs into that net. The one thing I'll say is there's been all sorts of creativity happening among our players. I think a lot of people have seen uh, some players' wives um, and some, some players' family members flipping balls and guys swinging into nets. And a lot of that is driven by our, our coaches' suggestions as well. We're looking for every possible way to, to be creative to stay in shape. And I would imagine that the it's the coaches, strength, staff, conditioning folks are in touch with these players, right? I mean, we can't be together, but we do have this kind of technology. I would have to think that some of that stuff is, a lot of that stuff is happening. Sure, Dave, like you, you, you mentioned at the top of the call, this is kind of uh, different territory and we're all looking at each other through a computer screen. So we're really lucky uh, that this is happening in, with, with this kind of technology because we can have face-to-face -face communication with our players and do so regularly. And we can send them drills and post them on, on platforms where they can access them. And our coaches can get together and do things like have uh, book clubs and, and go over books that we're reading together. And every single day we're having that face-to-face -face communication, we're using text messages, we're using any means possible to stay connected, not just as coaches and players, but as people. Uh, I've heard the name Dubon a couple times. I can't resist asking a little bit more about him. I think I, I just think so far on makes the trade last summer, Drew Pomeranz, who had a great couple, you know, he, he had some success with us early in the year, but particularly had a great couple weeks leading up to the deadline. And Mauricio Dubon's this big prospect with the Brewers has connections to Northern California guy who got a major league at bat actually against the Giants in the middle of last summer, and he ends up being the centerpiece of that trade. He comes over, gets some playing time down the stretch, and I just think a lot of Giants fans fell in love with not just the, I mean, he's definitely got talent, he's got tools, you can see the talent on the field, but he's got this energy and smile and laugh and clear passion for the game. I've been asked about him a lot this off season. You know, what, what is it about him, aside from those things that I just meant, what, you know, what makes him as talented a young player as he is? What do you guys like about him? I'm, I'm curious about Dubon. Uh, I, I'll keep going because I did have, have the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to run a couple of things by him today. I'll tell you what makes him special to me right now. Um, and, and this is a, a great credit to Zach Manazian, our, our pro scouting director. It's a credit to some of our coaches, certainly for, uh, to Farhan for identifying him. As, as being as talented he, as he is, but also understanding his makeup. And I asked him what he's doing with his time related to like what TV shows he's watching, what's, he's, what's he reading. It's baseball nonstop. He's watching old games. He's watching footage against Kershaw. He broke down how Kershaw attacks him. He said, he's going to attack me with cutters on my hands. He's going to try to get me to chase off the plate. We flipped it to Walker Bueller. He talked about how Bueller pitches up in the zone a lot, and that's really good for some of the older hitters in the league, but he referenced the, youngers in the younger hitters in, in the league know how to defend themselves against that pitch up, and he's had some success because all he does is look up against Walker Bueller. And I just think it's kind of cool that he eats, dr drinks, sleeps baseball, and like you said, Dave, he's always smiling and energetic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about um... – you know, at FanFest, I think, Dave, you may have been moderating that panel when uh, we had him up on stage and he was up with a group of players, including his hero, Brandon Crawford, and he couldn't say Brandon's name or even look at him in the eye. I mean, and I think, it, you know, in a nutshell, that encapsulates why, you know, I, I think it's easy to get enamored with Mauricio because the enthusiasm and love he has of the game, he's a charming guy, and... You know, he shows up at the, we saw this last year and we saw this in spring training. Um, you know, he does treat, and it sounds a little cheesy, but he treats every day he gets to play baseball and play at the major league level as a gift. And I think for some of us that get caught up in the grind, I think for us, it's really energizing. And, and that's what fans want to see. They want to see guys that, you know, play with that energy and have an appreciation, um, uh, you know, for the opportunity that they have. I also, just from a baseball standpoint, one of the things that we talked about a lot this offseason was the possibility of starting to move him around to different positions. He's obviously played second and short, and based on how a roster came together, there was the thought that he might fit in center field. Um, 
you know, we even talked a little bit about playing him some at third base, which isn't, you know, a traditional or typical position for a guy like him to play. Um, and, you know, that winds up being a little bit of a barometer for players, particularly young players, when you go to them and ask about their willingness to play different positions. And it's not a critique to guys that, um, you know, are more reluctant to do it, but baseball is, you know, baseball players are creatures of habit and creatures of comfort. And anytime you get put in an uncomfortable position, um, you know, it, it, it creates more of a challenge and it's a tough enough game as it is. But I was so excited. I know Gabe and his staff were excited about how he embraced the challenge and was excited about the challenge of moving around the infield, of, of playing the outfield. And nobody was more confident in his ability to play center field than he was himself. And that's what you love to see too. So uh, we were really excited. He actually swinged the bat really well in spring training, uh, moving around and, uh, you know, we were excited to see what he was going to do this year. Hopefully we still get that opportunity and uh, really happy to have him in Giants uniform. Yeah. Hey, hey, Dave, Dave, just wanted to add one thing that I, I think some of our fans are aware of. I'm not sure uh, how much. And, and that is, and Farhan has really brought this with his staff and the scouting, um, you know, the ability to bring local kids and local young uh, players onto the team. Um, you know, Mauricio grew up in Honduras, but was raised high school years in Sacramento. And um, I, I think it's really cool that, you know, the fact that Brandon Crawford was his hero growing up. Um, and then you kind of, you know, step back and here's Brandon Crawford. Here's Brandon Crawford, who um, is, uh, you know, grew up in San Francisco, in the San Francisco area, and the famous picture of as a four-year-old, Save My Giants uh, on his dad's shoulders. Uh, and I just, the, the um, you're not always going to be able to do it, but it's a really an added bonus when uh, local guys that uh, grew up in the area or have some attachment to the area end up uh, wearing the major league uniform. Yeah, totally agree. Larry, uh, I thought maybe, because we're getting a lot of questions, and I, th I have a feeling some people are joined a few minutes after you and I kind of opened the call. We're getting lots of questions about baseball's plans and what, what about this Arizona plan and Maybe you could just, for the folks who jumped on midway through, since we're getting so many of those kind of, and I get it, I'm asking the same sure. questions too. Can we, can we play games with fans, without fans? Like, uh, maybe I thought you might revisit that just for a moment, uh, it, just to whet people's appetite about the kind of things that are being tossed around or discussed. Sure. So, so again, number one is health and safety, and that's we can't go anywhere um, to play whether it's here in San Francisco or anywhere uh, until we have that protocol established and we feel confident about the, the health and the safety. Um, there are a number of contingency plans in the, in the drawing, on the drawing board, but the word plan isn't really even the right word. And I think the commissioner said this, these are ideas and the ideas will be subject to pretty, pretty, you know, extreme scrutiny in terms of do they work from a health and safety standpoint? Um, so people have seen thoughts about Arizona, Florida, other locations with or without fans. Um, you know, we are just April 15th. And I think the, the work that's being done in the commissioner's office is going to be to, to sort of weigh all the plans, consult with local officials and federal officials and determine what, what's the art of the possible. Obviously, we'd love to return to Oracle Park for our fans on this call and for our, our greater pool of fans. Um, we will return to Oracle Park. We don't know when. Um, might there be other plans, other contingency plans that will be utilized so that fans can at least watch the Giants uh, on television and hear your description uh, on television and radio until we can get to Oracle Park? It's possible. It, no decision has been made. So there's, no, there's nothing in the drawer. Nobody has Rob Manford or any uh, baseball officials has a plan in the drawer they're just waiting to unveil. So we really appreciate our fans' patience. Um, as I say, we have plans in the works for whenever the, whenever the occurrence is that we can announce um, this is when it would, it'll start, these games are gonna be played, these games won't be played. One thing I said at the beginning, just to keep in mind is this is such, uh, extraordinary circumstances that um, the sort of the, the rules that govern baseball about October is the playoffs and everything ends by November. 
That's not necessarily the case this year. And that's why we're trying to keep stay as flexible as we can until we get a, a clear direction from baseball. And we will be in touch with our, our um, you know, with all of you as we go. And we encourage you to be in touch with your reps uh, and your, your account folks that you've come, come to know over the years with any questions. Yeah, a good point to emphasize. Just, you know, because Larry said it at the top of the call, everybody's got questions about what do I do with my deposit? What do I do with the tickets I've already committed to buy? You know, those, and what Larry said at the beginning of the call was we have folks who are happy to answer your questions now. We'll have the ability to answer more specifically sooner rather than later, but maybe not quite yet. Uh, one quick follow-up, Larry, because I've seen several questions pop up. There was a strange, not strange story, but an unusual story today about a, a test being used in conjunction with major league personnel. Do you have any thoughts on that story that popped up today about this Stanford University te center test that's uh, going on? Yes. So this is the this is the antibody, what's known as the antibody test, and they are looking for large populations to take it to see to get. It's really a research project more than specifically whether any one individual can, has the antibody, carries the antibody. So many of us, I, I did it, uh, within the Major League Baseball organizations, uh, took, were allowed to take the test. I think 25, 26 teams participated, and they're getting thousands of results across a vast population to try to understand um, how the immunity may work for those people that were exposed to, to COVID-19, those who were not, and to understand broad patterns within the population. I think we are all uh, well aware that as testing um, increases throughout our country, uh, that will, in various types of testing, that will permit us to get to uh, playing baseball faster as, as it develops. So we want to be, Major League Baseball wanted to be part of that. I'm very proud of the fact that Pretty much all the teams agreed to participate, and these are all front offices uh, that were first invited, and it will extend. But I'm very proud of the fact that we're on the on the front edge of, of doing that. Yeah, the thing that I read that was uh, I I was proud of it too was that the, these folks approach Major League Baseball just thinking, well, they have a lot of people who work for all these teams and in the Major League office. They're spread out all around the country. That's what we're looking for is a diversity of geography and. MLB said yes right away. Yes, we'll help. We're yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, we're, we're looking at a public health um, crisis, and we're able to, what we want to help in any way. And the other thing we talk a lot about in the front office, and I think you've seen some of the messages we've been putting out, is that when baseball is back, we really feel that, that the games in the park, the games on television, the games on radio will be part of the healing that we're going to be so desperate to achieve in this in this country in this society and uh, and uh, baseball over the years has if you go back a hundred years um, has been that elixir that that opportunity and even locally here we remember post earthquake and post nine one one you know nine eleven the uh, what baseball had and the the important role it played in, in the healing process yeah well said. Uh, okay, I heard the name Joey Bart a couple times. Now, a lot of our fans want to know about Joey, but I thought maybe as opposed to you can say nice things about him if you want or whatever you want to say about uh, one of our big young players, but to him, number one, uh, minor league seasons are obviously suspended too. So we all focus on big league teams. Huge part of Farhan, your objective with the Giants is to, to – pump up the farm system to get development ramped up even more than it has been to produce as much young talent as we can produce. What happens to those young players who just like our big leaguers are not playing right now? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're sort of in the same boat where we have a player development infrastructure and we're staying in touch with our players. We're, you know, hoping that they can stay in shape to whatever extent they can safely do it. And obviously there are challenges in the current environment with doing that but as much as anything we just want to stay connected with them on a communication level um, and you know right now I think you know that sense of cohesiveness as an organization and as a team is as important as anything um, in terms of playing 
it's sort of a conversation that's going to have to happen in parallel with what happens at the major league level, which is uh, what does happen to players that are not in the major leagues. Um, you know, how does the, you know, how does development take place, whether it's, you know, uh, in the base case scenario where the minor leagues is just up and running kind of at a similar time frame to the major leagues, or, you know, is there some alternative framework where you're still able to get your young players reps and um, instruction so that, um, you know, it's, it, you know, they can continue to develop as you hope they would coming into this season. Um, so for us, uh, you know, given the fact that our farm systems come a long way, we have a lot of guys that we're excited about. And I think this was going to be a huge year for a lot of those guys and Joey Bart and Ramos and a couple of other guys really had a chance to advance through the system and get to the big leagues this year. Um, hopefully we have an infrastructure in place where they still have the opportunity to do that. So that's going to be a priority of ours. It's obviously a priority for everyone in major league baseball, but I think for an organization like ours that is going to be so reliant on our young pipeline going forward, it's going to be a particular point of emphasis to make sure that we can still accomplish some level of development for those players. Farhan, what has happened? Uh, I mean, why is it you've only been with us for 18 months? I think when you took over, you know, the Giants farm system, if you took a consensus ranking was pretty low. And I saw rankings this off season from, you know, who knows, who's right or wrong, but, you know, consistently top 10 ish. Uh, that's a pretty big leap in one year. What happened? I think it's a combination of factors. One is uh, there's just some natural uh, cyclicality to farm systems. I mean, you, you know, you go through a period of contention and you're pushing chips in. Um, and then, you know, maybe when you're going through more of a developing phase, you know, you're accumulating talent and you're a little more focused on development. Uh, our international scouting department led by Joe Salermo has done a wonderful job over the last few years, uh, you know, getting kids like Luciano and Canario that may be a little bit further behind than the names that our fans hear more often, but, you know, may turn out to be just as impactful. So really excited about that. And obviously we've been able to make some trades and some smaller moves over the last couple of years uh, that have helped supplement that main pipeline of talent that we have coming through the system. You know, Larry mentioned, you know, some of our focus on bringing in players that have Bay Area ties and roots. And we're excited about Hunter Bishop, our first round pick from last year, who's from the Bay Area and, you know, grew up a Giants fan. Couldn't be more excited to put this uniform on. Had the chance to come over and uh, play with a big club in a couple of spring training games. Um, and, you know, he's yet another guy that we're really looking forward to seeing um, at the Major League level in the coming years. Gabe, he looks apart, doesn't he? Hunter Bishop? Yes, he does. He stands, stands out in a uniform. Um, you know, I, I want to be very careful here. I'm not, I'm not comparing him in any way, shape, or form to Bryce Harper, but there's something about the way he plays the game um, and the violence of his swing and the interesting high, high confidence level in the dugout and excitement about getting into the batter's box. It kind of reminded me a little bit about of Bryce. Again, just making it very clear, different players altogether, but he really hustles hard. He, he works hard. Uh, in the clubhouse, he works hard in the weight room, and when he gets out into the to to the field, in between the lines, he plays like his hair is on fire and runs out every single ball. Made a great impression on the coaching staff. I think his teammates respect the way he goes about his business. Yeah, uh, it, it it stood out to me. Just you, know, you you just see him physically; he looks the part. How Gabe? How much exposure? I mean, at spring training for you is there's so much going on. There's so many players. You're talking to your coaches about all kinds. Of, there's a lot going on at spring training. How much exposure do you have to those young players? Farhan rattled off a few of their names. I did too. Like, do you get a chance to see some of the young guys, at least at least some? Yeah, I've had an opportunity to get a little bit of exposure. Not not as much exposure, obviously, as, as Farhan or somebody like Kyle Haynes, our, our farm director, um, who has – an incredible amount of exposure to these players. So a lot of my learning is, is through the eyes of, of Barhan, through the eyes of Kyle, um, through the eyes of, of our hitting coordinator and our pitching coordinator. Like those are the people that give me the most exposure. Sure, I can see Ramos in one game and watch him hit a ball 400 and however many feet. And that was really exciting, but that was a real snapshot. To get the real goods on a player, you really have to ask a lot of questions. So just ask the people that know better. Well, Gabe, somehow we've gotten many questions about the guitar that's behind you. 
Yeah. It, can, you, can you tell us about it? It's, it's interesting the way everybody sets up um, their Zoom calls, right? Because if you do, if you do something like put a guitar <laughs> behind you, you better be prepared to answer the question. So uh, a couple of days ago, um, I drove, I'm in Scottsdale now, and I drove halfway uh, to California, essentially, and stopped in, in Indio, California, to meet a friend who brought me my, my bass guitar. Um, I just kind of put it in my mind that I'm going to get reacquainted with the instrument and I am so rusty. It does not sound good yet, but I have, uh, I have aspirations to come out of this, this quarantine with much better skills and um, jam with any of our players. A, a couple of years back, I, I learned that a lot of players play instruments and even back to my playing days, I played with Evan Longoria in the, in the clubhouse in Tampa. He plays little drums. I have the bass guitar and, we jammed together on, on a number of different occasions, and I hope that the same thing happens this year at some point at Oracle Park. Farhan, I, I, I put a house plant behind me. What, you, 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 did, you got no background whatsoever. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, I'm going to bring the cowbell when we jam next time, Caps. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, like I said, I'm just trying to find a quiet corner of the house with the baby, uh, you know, <laughs> set to erupt at any moment. So I don't have the luxury of putting cool items behind me, so. I know I would ask you about like, hey, have you learned to cook something during these few weeks? But you're with a nine month old. <laughs> yeah, I can't you know, imagine. I mean, it is. It, it's it's obviously they're they're really difficult times. You have to put everything in perspective. It is, uh, uh you know, a blessing to get to spend time uh, with your kids, especially you know, baby at that age where normally we've been in the grind of the season and be difficult. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, you know, I think my wife would tell you I'm performing below expectations, not being as useful as uh, she might otherwise think I should be considering I'm around all the time, but that's a work in progress. That's really what I should be focused on is being, being useful uh, to her. So, <laughs> Gabe, let me ask you about, go ahead, Larry, you're muted. Larry, wait, you got to unmute yourself. Sorry. There you go. Okay. Um, I just want to do a true confession here. Okay. Yes. My background changed to, I think, like a ceiling or a wall because I had a background actually with some pictures, Willie Mays, et cetera. But I realized there have been so many doggone Zoom calls today. The iPad I've been using was about to run out of juice. Uh -huh. and so I had to go to like right next to a plug to get the, to charge the, the thing. Um, that's kind of the story of our lives these days, right? Yeah, it is. Trying to figure out what the best spot to do all this stuff is. That's okay. He still still looks like a good backdrop to me. So Speaking of Willie Mays. I flip off, I'll flip off and flip back on um, in a second here and because uh, I think I've recharged. And, and uh, okay. yeah, so I'm, no not, I'm not avoiding you. Speaking of Willie Mays, did you guys see, I mean, I, I've, I've been reading them just because they're fabulous. Joe Posnanski is a wonderful baseball writer, has had this series on the, the Athletic about counting down the top 100 baseball players of all time and has written these unbelievable essays about all of them. And so my kids and I have been following along and reading a lot of them. I admit not all of them because they're long. <laughs> they're, there are a hundred of them. He's, he said he's written over 280,000 words total for this project, which is longer than Moby Dick anyway. <laughs> and so we got to, we got to the top five and we were guessing who'd be in the top five. And Barry comes up at number three and, you know, a lot of suspense, number two, number one. And we wake up one morning last week and Babe Ruth is number two, which we know what that means. And last night uh, we all read the uh, Willie Mays number one essay, which I thought was just, I don't know why that tickled me so much, but a guy that we get to see at the ballpark basically every day, uh, the greatest baseball player of all time. And it was just a wonderful, anybody who's out there, watching and hasn't read those essays if you have some have a subscription they are well worth reading really beautiful you know we felt very blessed i think maybe the last time we were all together physically was a saturday night during um a weekend in scottsdale and we were all at a steakhouse we had the group of giants owners and and executives and front office and broadcasters coaches uh gabe and farhan were there and um willie was there and whenever you're in his presence, um, you know, he's such a beautiful person and such, has such, you know, beautiful memories for us all to, uh, 
to um, to live by in the game of baseball. And I think those memories go a long way in today's world as we um, think about baseball in an April where we're not yet playing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think this is probably true for a lot of people. I, I read all of Joe's, he's, you know, one of my favorites and I, I know he's, uh, you know, really beloved in the baseball and sports community. He's an amazing writer, uh, really enjoyed reading those. And I think all of us have been kind of watching a lot of baseball classics and, you know, I don't know whether it's that we just get stuck in the grind of the day job, but I'm really not somebody that watches a lot of kind of older classic games generally, but uh, you know, with a lack of alternatives right now. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun to reacquaint with baseball history and see some of the great moments. I mean, I was watching, you know, the 2004 playoffs with the Red Sox and saw Cap out there and I was kind of texting him screenshots of the game and he was like, I have MLB Network too. You don't have to keep sending me these shots. I know I played for that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously it's, 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 it's not, you know, the same as us having two baseball in 2020 but you know it's been fun I mean there's there's certainly uh you know all of us that work in the game are fans too and you know whether it's reading great columns like the ones that Joe's been writing or watching some of these great games and some of the great Giants games from the last decade that have been on too it's been funny for me you know I've been I experienced those games as a competitor and now I'm in the Giants organization and I get to kind of relive those moments from a totally different perspective that's been a lot of fun for me. Uh, our, old friend, Pat Gallagher, our old friend Pat Gallagher uh, sent me a note. Um, this is something I haven't had a chance to do, but remember Ken Burns' nine innings yeah. on baseball? I never got through all nine innings, and um, you know, this is something, something I would encourage the fans to, to do. Totally seconded. Gabe, when you got the chance to chat with Willie, was it fun? It was fun. Uh, it kind of felt like – it kind of surreal, you know, when you when you first shake his hand, it's it's such a powerful moment. But um, you know, obviously, he ends up as you know at least one of the top three baseball players of all time. And for a guy who hit you know career three hundred, yeah, number one, six hundred and sixty <laughs> home runs. It's and all. set forever. There's no more debate. He's That's right. Now. That's right. I, I I guess just like being in the presence of somebody that I always considered to be one of the best all time players. Um, I'm I'm a history buff when it comes to baseball, but also a baseball card collector. So like the early 1950s baseball cards, I was always kind of salivating over. Um, I think it was 52 was Mays' rookie card. And I can still picture that card in my head if it's 52, 53, 51. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like being in the presence of a legend, almost somebody that's bigger than life. And I, I was definitely fumbling over my words that day uh, because I was probably a little bit nervous and uh, it was an exciting moment one that I'll never forget yeah 1951 Willie Mays rookie of the year although he does still admit I mean part of that essay was talking about him coming up and he went one for 26 and the anxiety of a young player and you're reading that going God, you know, this is Willie Mays and even he was anxious about getting his career going and uh and he, even to this day, Willie will admit that in that on-deck circle, because he was in the on-deck circle when Bobby Thompson hit the most famous home run in baseball history, he was rooting for Bobby Thompson to make sure that he didn't have to come up to the plate and with the season on the line. I mean, that, if, if you need any more evidence of how hard Major League Baseball is, that's the greatest who's ever played saying, I didn't know if I could do it, uh, which, you know, we knew he could do it, but. Hey, can, I, can I give yeah, the ahead, that? I was just going to say, so recently we had a, a Zoom call, our entire coaching staff with Will Clark. And so you mentioned the, the Willie story about, you know, not wanting necessarily to come up to the plate in that big moment. Will Clark told our coaching staff that there was never a moment in his career that he didn't want the bat in his hands. He, it, was, it was remarkable. And like hearing Willie's humility and vulnerability to be able to say something like that is so cool. And then to be able to contrast that with Will's just endless confidence, you know, you're around Giants legends like that, and, and it, it can't help but make you pretty proud. Yeah, it, was, it started his first at bat against Nolan. When you hit a home run against Nolan yeah. Ryan, you're, you know, to start your career, I guess yeah. you should be pretty confident. Yeah, uh, and he, he, he told that story. He talked about how the first pitch of that at bat was a big curveball, and he, he stepped out of the box and, and giggled to himself, kind of smiled. And the catcher looked up and said, like, you know, what are you, what are you laughing at? He said, 
the Express just threw me a curveball in the first pitch of my career. <laughs> I looked for a fastball for the rest of the at bat and, and went deep in the Astrodome to center field. It's a pretty, pretty special story. I, it makes sense why he has all that confidence. Yeah, no kidding. Hey, Larry, uh, there was a question that popped up. We have so many questions. I apologize. We're not going to get to all of them. But, you know, Will, Will's retirement, number retirement ceremony is planned for this year. And there was a question about what will happen with stuff like that if the season is, you know, delayed more or we come up, you know, I mean, it might be worth you mentioning if, you know, if we don't get to do some things like that, uh, would we have contingency plans, I assume? Absolutely. So for sure, it was, you know, it was kind of indelibly in our, in our minds, July 11th uh, is the plan. And if we are not at Oracle Park playing baseball July 11th, uh, we will we will uh, reschedule it and uh, reschedule it to a time that's going to be you know equally convenient. It was a weekend day game and it was a day that uh, we were all looking forward to. And you know we've been in touch with Will and we've been talking about it and uh, he totally understands and he's completely flexible. So when we get the all clear, um, look for us to look for that to get rescheduled. Hey, one quick postscript to uh, Willie. When I was growing up and following Willie uh, and loved him and would go with my dad out on the, on the muni to watch him at Candlestick, there was a date that always stuck in my mind um, because it, was, it was, became pretty noteworthy, and that was May 6th. So May 6th is Willie's birthday, and uh, God willing, we'll celebrate uh, uh, either online or um, get together if we can uh, to uh, celebrate Willie's 89th birthday uh, in less than a month. Cannot wait. Some of my favorite memories actually are at the ballpark with the whole crowd singing happy birthday to yes. Willie. Those are fun. Those are fun nights or days. My, I'll give you my one favorite personal Willie story from last year when my son started to, my son's 10 now, started to come to more games with me last year. He could kind of not bother everybody and be upstairs and not interrupt the broadcast. And so he wants to come to games. He, he, he's crazy about it. So we come and we walk into the clubhouse early, just, you know, not to go all the way back there, just to pop in and say hi. And there's Willie uh, in the clubhouse. So I bring my son in to say hi to Willie. And after a conversation, Willie's showing him how you should wear your glove. And you got to push it a little extra up because you need that extra half inch. If you're an outfielder, you know, you might get you know, a ball that you don't get. He's given my son all these tips. And uh, at the end, he asks, David if he wants a signed ball so they my son no dummy says yes I would like a signed ball from you and uh, so Willie signs him this ball that he has and says to himself oh that's a terrible signature turns the ball halfway signs it again and hands David and so David has a ball with two Willie Mays wow. signatures on it which I think is probably not many people have that vintage Willie he he has it you know what's amazing and Talk about his grip and everything. Uh, he hasn't lost his grip, and he hasn't lost his say hey qualities. He has not. Um, he just, he's as animated and as fun, loving, and as full of spirit and love as, as ever. Yeah, he really has uh, not lost any of that. Farhan, uh, I saw a question, but several actually pop up about the draft. Uh, that's an interesting one to me because there have been some changes put in place about the draft already uh your thoughts on how the draft might be changing a little bit or is changing a little bit how that impacts us you yeah I, you know i there's good you know thinking about the draft there's really two things that are going to be fundamentally different about it one is it's going to be a shorter draft um there's some talk about it being you know as short as five rounds though uh you know there's a chance that it gets extended a little bit beyond that um and the second is you know, how those selections are made, there obviously isn't going to be amateur baseball this spring. Um, and so everything we know about these players, we probably know already and have to go off of that body of information. Uh, so for our amateur staff, they've been keeping busy uh, going through the information that we have, watching old video, getting on calls like this and talking through players. Um, you know, it's been an interesting exercise for them because it is – more conversation than just going out and watching games and um you know in some sense you get more out of it when you're really debating players and, and talking through things rather than just running around the country submitting reports and then you get together at the end and 
you know, really talk about these players for the first time right before the draft. So I think the exercise has been different for the scouts, but, you know, an interesting one for them to go through. Uh, and for us, you know, we do have a couple of compensation picks, which we will still have, um, you know, even in a shorter draft form. So that's valuable. Did Farhan freeze up for you guys? Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, there we go. You're back. I thought Jazz. Oh, I thought Jazz. <laughs> yeah, might be a little erratic there. I don't know how much you caught of that, but. Um, Most of uh, just the last sentence probably got cut off. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just saying, I, I you know, we're well, we're well positioned with our extra picks. And, you know, I, I think our scouts feel good about the information we have. They're going to keep kind of grinding until that draft. Uh, winds up happening that date is still a little bit in question but it'll be later this summer yeah it feels like a big important day for the Giants coming up um, whenever it happens Gabe one of the Gabe one of the best Giants draft picks of all time is Buster Posey and Buster you know the last couple of years has admitted he has not been himself with his health and he had the major major surgery and it, last year was coming back from that Everybody said that in spring training, he looked healthy and he was feeling really confident about things. What was your impression of Buster during the spring and how he looked? Yeah, Buster looked great. Um, and I'll go back to the beginning of our conversation. One of the reasons I think our coaches felt so encouraged was because Buster asked for challenges. He, he recognized that the last year wasn't his best year. Some of that was because of the hip injury, but um, he also knows that there's more in the tank. So he devoted his time and effort in, into working in the cage with Donnie Ecker and Justin Veely and Dustin Lynn and really took to the mechanical cues that they were giving him. One of them was keeping a little bit more weight on the inside of his foot um, or, or the way it, it looks on film is a little bit more weight on the inside of his knee. Uh, it just gives him a little bit more balance. Uh, additionally, he worked really hard on, on defense and is willing to take a look at some of his past game calling and, and get even better. He's just so open-minded and has such a great growth mindset and he's just a team first player um so all of those things came out in camp i think our, our coaches developed great relationships with him he he was a leader in the clubhouse he asked great questions all of the things that giants fans know about him um, and i think he was just the best version of himself during camp let me uh let me ask this of you three, because I see we've gone past the top of the hour. Sort of, are you guys good with hanging on for a little while longer and sure, talking sure. a little more Absolutely. baseball? You're okay. Um, okay, good. Me too. Uh, I think we can go on for a little bit longer. We still got a lot of people watching. Uh, Gabe, you have a lot of. Whenever we get this season started, I mean, I I sent an obnoxious text to Farhan on on opening day, what would have been opening day, proposing my starting lineup. I just thought, yeah, he, Farhan probably really needs to hear from me. Uh, Dave, I, I, Dave, I actually forwarded that to Cap and told him <laughs> we hired the wrong guy. We had a manager in house. <laughs> hey, this is a, this is a true story, Dave. I can screenshot it and send it to you. <laughs> well, I was just having some fun because I was missing opening day. And it was Kershaw, so I thought, hey, maybe the lineup would look a little different than we'd all yeah. assume. But I'm not asking you what the starting lineup would have been. I am asking you, it seems to me that the roster, however it shakes out, there would be a lot of choices for you. I mean, there, there, you know, we talked about Dubon versatility, but Wilmer Flores is a new giant. He can play all over the place. Uh, you got right-handers, left-handers. Seems like it's a team where you are going to have a lot of decisions to make every day. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, Farhan and Scott did a really good job of giving us a lot of mix and match options. So you could see a very different lineup if you have a left-handed pitcher on the mound than you might with a right-handed pitcher on the mound uh, to get the platoon advantage. And obviously we have some great weapons, like you mentioned, Flores against left-handed pitchers, Hunter Pence, that everybody knows about how good he's been against left-handed pitching. But we also have some sneaky guys who can hit high velocity right-handed pitching like Pablo Sandoval is a, a great option in those scenarios. Uh, Tyler Heineman is, is really good against Velo. So yeah, we've got some good mix and match lineups. So the one thing that I'd say is you're probably not going to see the the same lineup repeated every night. Um, and that's just because we have uh, good platoon options everywhere and guys who can play all over the diamond, like Farhan mentioned earlier with Dubon, you know, part of the reason that his versatility is so attractive and so valuable to a team is because he doesn't have to stay in one place. That means we can play somebody else in those positions that he plays. 
and, and move him around to, to utilize his versatility and his right-handed bat against lefties. And there were some, I mean, for people maybe who joined uh, later, I mean, Darren Ruff was putting up these big numbers. There were decisions to be made for you guys uh, by the end of spring. And, you know, I'd say spring in quotes now. Whenever that comes, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take for everybody to ramp up and get ready to play. Maybe you have some thoughts on that. But, but then there are also decisions to be made. Yeah, I mean, we talked earlier on about some of the competition we had, which you always want to have, and it's fun until you have to start making some of those difficult decisions. But, you know, as we think about ramping up baseball and playing again, hopefully soon, um, you know, there's a lot of things on the table in terms of what the games look like, what the rules look like. And in that sense, having a lot of options and having a lot of versatility on your roster, uh, you know, could potentially be an advantage for us. I mean, if we wind up having a relatively quick spring and pitchers aren't stretched out, you know, and, and, you know, Gabe and his staff have the ability to match up in the middle of games and later in games. Um, you know, there's a lot of variables on the table and, and it's kind of fun and exciting to think about. Obviously it's not the priority for us right now, but when you start thinking about how things were coming together in the spring, the fact that we had the ability to mix and match, we feel like we have good depth in the organization. You know, if we wind up in a sprint uh, of a 2020 season, I think that could really play to our advantage. Yeah, nobody wants to speculate on that kind of stuff. And Larry's been hammering that point home of so much of that is out of our control when the season starts, how long the season goes. But there is a chance it's not a full 162. I would think a pretty good chance it's not a full 162 game season at this point. Uh, I mean, it, that would that could really change strategy from a manager, from a GM, a, a guy putting together a roster. I mean, that that would present some interesting challenges, questions for you guys if, if the season were a shorter season. I think even beyond the number of games, it becomes a question of, you know, how quickly are you playing those games? You know, there's been talk about more double headers and fewer off days just to get the most out of the time that we have. And that's where I think the depth can really play to your advantage. Yeah. And then I think, you know, a lot of this is, is speculative, like, like Larry pointed out and like um, Farhan just reiterated, um, but the size of the roster will also play into our, our strategy and how, how quickly we, we change pitchers by way of example. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of those things will be interesting to see how they unfold and uh, it'll be exciting either way for, for our coaching staff. Hey, Larry, let me ask you this, uh, if I can. I mean, maybe there's no real answer to it, but is there a chance we see a little experimentation with rules with you know do you hear any talk about that of okay we're all waiting to hear when we can get going again we understand that part of it but if we can get going again is there a chance we see some even if they're just temporary sort of changes to the way that either the game is played or the way teams are set up Dave I think it's a great question I think the answer is yes um, we, we really you know there's been a, a fair amount of study um, before we got into the, the public health crisis, um, you know, a fair amount of study about ways to improve baseball in terms of the, of the pace of the game and in terms of its appeal to um, various generations, the younger generation, and, um, and, just, and just ways as, as every sport does, right? And, you know, the NBA hasn't had the three-point line forever. Uh, the NFL's have, NFL hasn't protected its quarterbacks. Uh, forever protected his quarterbacks forever um, you know and we haven't really had that many changes to baseball over the over recent time uh, maybe the most recent was the DH and we've had little tweaks but you know are there ways that the game can be improved and I think to the point that uh, Farron and Gabe were making you know there will be there could be some changes uh, that maybe we test in a different kind of season where you have to have uh you know you have other circumstances and it's it's not out of out of the realm of possibility at all um and I think it could be intriguing and um, I don't want to throw any out there because there's nothing on the table that's actionable that anybody has agreed on yet but um you know possibly some of the studied ideas that would have been implemented maybe a year from now maybe a couple of years from now that collective bargaining agreement with the players is up after 21, 2021. And maybe, you know, some of these would, would be bargained naturally with the players. Who knows? Maybe you could, you could look at um, a couple of ideas that both the players and, 
owners embrace in this environment that could, uh, that could really work well and, and be a test for, for future use. And, you know, one example of that is extra innings. And I know, Dave, you love calling those 17, 18 inning <laughs> games. So I don't want to take those away from you. But, um, you know, if, if we're in a s season where, you know, we're in a little bit of a sprint uh, to get games in, you know, those games kind of take a lot of air out of the bloom from a roster standpoint, from a fatigue standpoint. And in the minor leagues, they, you know, went to this extra inning rule of putting a runner on second base to start the 10th inning. It shorted games. There was a lot of positive feedback. So, you know, again, there haven't been specific discussions, but, you know, just as, you know, a little bit of a brainstorm, I could see that being something that's revisited. And, you know, I think, you know, we can have a little fun with some of these rules and, you know, nothing is set in stone going forward, but, you know, in a season where we're dealing with special circumstances, it might be fun to try some of this stuff out. But that, but Farhan, that would deprive Dave of calling the walk-off in the bottom of the 18th. <laughs> Am I, am I remembering it correctly? I, I do believe last year we had an 18 inning game and I think it was one of those nights where I was working alone. And I think Farhan sent me a text in about the 17th inning that said something along the lines of, how are you still talking? Or maybe <laughs> why are you still talking? I think yeah, no, I, I, you know, I felt like it took walk off. I, I felt like it took a lot of endurance just listening to you for 17 innings. <laughs> I can't imagine doing the talking. Uh, that's fair. Uh, all right. Well, I, we, I know we're, we're supposed to wrap this up uh, by about 7.15 or so. Maybe we could have some final thoughts. I mean, I'll go first and just say how much I miss all of our season ticket holders, our Giants fans. Uh, I'm so used to not just talking to everybody on television and radio, but walking around town and talking Giants baseball. I mean, I miss that almost as much as anything. Uh, so hang in there with us. I'm really glad we got a chance to do this tonight. I hope we can do some more of this kind of stuff uh, for as long as we need to until we can get uh, things going. I, I mean, Larry said it, but I, there are a lot of people working really hard right now to try to figure out when we get the okay to try some stuff, get some games in, get this thing started. There are a lot of people who are putting in a lot of time and effort to try to figure out how that works. So I appreciate that. I appreciate the way that everybody is – is listening to this social distancing stuff and doing the right thing. We've saved a lot of lives in California, a lot by doing the right thing. We should all be really proud about that. I'll leave you with one personal anecdote from the uh, shelter in place. Last week, John, Dwayne, Mike, and I were recording a PSA for the state of California to encourage people to shelter in place and keep doing what they're doing and they're doing a great job. We're connected with the governor's office. This is name drop central. We're connected with the governor's office in Sacramento and we're doing this. I mean, the four of us are, we're doing like practice, funny calls. I don't know when they're going to produce the video. We'll see it at some point, I assume, of people doing things at home and uh, kind of making it all up, goofing around. And the governor walks by in the hall and hears our voices and comes in and interrupts our little recording session and sits down because he just wanted to talk some baseball and some, and he just told us the four of us uh, how much he misses the giants and getting to watch and listen to us. And he just can't wait until our season starts again. So anyway, I mean, that is a name drop, but I, it, you know, coming from a guy who's working really hard himself and doing a lot of good things for a lot of us. Uh, he made a point of coming in just to tell us and you all through us, uh, he understands how much everybody's missing the Giants because he does too. So thanks everybody for being with us. Farhan, Gabe, Larry, I'll leave the floor to you guys before we wrap it up just to, for some final thoughts. Well, and echo those thoughts, uh, Dave, on, on the governor. And we're very proud of, of uh, him. He actually has a World Series ring, at, at least at City Hall, because uh, our first championship was when uh, Gavin Newsom was mayor. And um, he's a... He, what he's doing, um, the, also the elected officials are working tire, tirelessly. Uh, you know, Governor Cuomo in New York as well. And uh, um, I, I just wanted to say that you know, I think the way you started out was really a, a beautiful way that baseball in many ways is a, a marker of our lives. Today's baseball. Today, April 15th, is Jackie Robinson Day. It's also the anniversary, as you noted, of um, the very first game in San Francisco, April 15th, 1958. Ruben Gomez and a shutout in Orlando Cepeda. And a lot of us, you know, live our lives 
um, with baseball having these, these amazing milestone dates. Uh, I mentioned Willie May's birthday, May 6th, that many of us remember. And um, I just think that, you know, as we go through these tough times and as we come out of these tough times, uh, and we will, um, that um, hopefully baseball, the memories of baseball can sustain us and can keep us strong. And, um, you know, I, we pray for the frontline workers, the medical workers and the police and the fire and the EMS and everybody doing what they're doing. And, um, and I just hope that baseball, even watching the, uh, the replays of games, um, you and John and Dwayne and Mike on radio, listening on radio and watching on television, and um, somehow, somehow, we never lose those games. Yeah, so, somehow the ones we show back again are always end up pretty, pretty positively. Amazing. So uh, hopefully that can give comfort to our fans, and we just ask our fans, and especially any that are, um, you know, are suffering in any way with family or themselves, um, just our thoughts and, and prayers are with you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, you know, uh, again, I echo a lot of what you guys have said already. I mean, it's funny when you think back to, you know, when baseball was shut down and, you know, those last couple of weeks in March where so much was still unknown and it was really scary. I, I got to be honest, like, I didn't want to think about baseball. I didn't really care about what our team looked like or, uh, you know, what our prospects were, or when we were going to play again. I was just worried about, you know, taking care of our employees, making sure everything was safe, making sure we shut down our facility in a way that was safe for our employees and also responsible for the community. I mean, there was a lot of talk about, um, you know, even if you could keep things safe and contained within a, you know, within an isolated group, uh, you know, and you had relatively young, healthy people, it was more about being responsible for the community at large. And, you know, I am grateful that although we've got a long way to go, that things have gotten better nationally, that things have gotten better in our state where, <laughs> I feel comfortable with us getting together, having this kind of conversation, being able to talk about baseball. I think, you know, it's a reflection that things are at least moving in a positive direction, but, you know, echo the thoughts uh, that you guys have already mentioned about, you know, our thoughts being with the first responders, my, you know, wife's brother, uh, my brother-in-law is a, is a doctor working at an ER in Brooklyn right now. And obviously for the people in New York, it's a really difficult situation. So, you know, I know what a stressful and concerning time it is for, everybody that has friends and family that have been affected by this, that are working on the front lines. And, you know, I can say from a baseball standpoint that there'll be a time and place for baseball. And, and when baseball rings the bell, the Giants will be ready and we'll be excited to go out there and do our fans proud. Awesome. Gabe. Sure. Um, I, I'll just support what, what Larry and you've said, Dave, and what, what Farhan just said, um, share that this is absolutely an unprecedented time. These are uncharted waters. Uh, our players, uh, myself, everybody under the clubhouse roof, nobody knows exactly what to do under these circumstances. Like Larry mentioned earlier, like baseball is an elixir. It's not just an elixir for for fans, it's not just an elixir for players, it's, it's an elixir for all of us. And so, um, because we know how big that responsibility is, uh, we will make sure our players and our staff will make sure that we bring fans into our worlds during this time. We'll express vulnerabilities. We'll tell you we're scared also. We'll tell you that we support all of you. But we'll also tell you that we're excited about, about what's to come. We do know that baseball will will be back. And, and what it is, like everybody on this call has said, that we're gonna be prepared for that moment. And in the meantime, we're gonna, we're gonna share what we're experiencing with you and, and lean on each other. So just appreciate being a part of this group. Thank you, Gabe. And in the meantime, maybe I'll send you some lineup thoughts too. Yeah, <laughs> so that's, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll the middle it. man. We, we need all the help <laughs> we can get. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Farhan. Thanks, Gabe. And especially thanks to all of you all who are watching at home. We hope we gave you a little fun baseball talk in the midst of all this. We can't wait to do more and uh, be back with you. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, fans. Stay safe.